Test. Okay, we're going to get started. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Valerie Zaponta. I'm part of the marketing department here at City of Hope. Um, thank you so much for coming out this evening for tonight's Ask the Experts, uh, the lecture on progress for personalized treatment and lung cancer care. Tonight, we have two City of Hope physician experts with us who will be discussing advances in lung cancer care and three special City of Hope guests who will share part of their cancer journey with us. But before we get started, just a few things. Please take a moment to silence or turn off your cell phones. Um, and also, there is an evaluation form on your seat. So if you wouldn't mind filling that out and turning it in before you head out tonight, um, I'd really appreciate your feedback on tonight's program. And lastly, as you're thinking about questions for the Q&A session uh, later on in the program, just keep in mind that our, in this type of forum, our physicians um, can't answer second opinion type of questions. Um, so we'll begin. Dr. Jay Kim, Assistant Professor and Chief of the Division of Thoracic Surgery, we will be providing insight on lung cancer screenings and robotic surgery. But first, his special guest, Angie Romero, will get us started by sharing her lung cancer story with us. Angie? Um, good evening and thank you. Um, I wish to thank first to my family for going every step with me, excuse me, and to City of Hope. I was very fortunate and blessed to know my family history. My father had lung cancer, his father had lung cancer, and my mom, her mother, and she had, my mother had colon cancer. Um, Knowing this, I figured um, with my brothers already beginning to have issues with polyps, I figured I would be the one with lung cancer. In expecting our first grandson, I thought, well, I better get healthy. So I was exercising one day at a gym with a personal trainer and couldn't quite catch my breath. I thought maybe it's my asthma and I happened to have a doctor's appointment that day with my asthma doctor and I went to see her she said no your asthma's fine I have high blood pressure went to see my cardiologist no nope, wasn't that so he decided to do an x-ray with this x-ray they found the spot on my lung I never smoked I'm a non-smoker so it was interesting to find this spot um, excuse me <laughs> I'm grateful that the doctor took that x-ray. Um, I was sent to see a local specialist in the area that I live. And 
for about four to six months he was doing testing i didn't care for the his treatment i felt as if i was losing my opportunity he kept telling me don't worry everything will be okay i'll worry for you i sat there and said i don't think so so i came to city of hope and roughly about a year every three months we did testing i went through two biopsies they told me that yes if it is cancer you're very blessed because it is the slow growing cancer can't pronounce the name of it dr kim you can pronounce it for me because i can't even go there after the second biopsy then it was confirmed it was cancer and within two weeks um, the surgery was scheduled from moving slowly to bam 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 I don't even remember most of it um, I don't even remember her saying okay let's do the surgery I was just still trying to swallow yes you have cancer um, being a pro at surgery I have had several surgeries I have had a few health issues and it got to the point where my kids would tell me mom surgery to you is like a hobby you think I'd look like Barbie by now but no it wasn't those elective surgeries um, disc replacement carpal tunnel all that lovely stuff when I was wheeled into the surgery room I remember it being a little bit larger and a wall I think of computers at least that's what it seemed like. And it seemed like an army of people in there. And you're a little taken aback because you know that guy's not medical, but he, you know he belongs in there. And he was handling the computers, if I remember correctly. Um, after surgery, I remember coming out of the anesthesia um, a bit easier it wasn't as traumatic it wasn't as difficult um, I had pain but the pain was not with the surgical sites it was more from the IV I hate IVs the blood pressure monitor and the drain tube those hurt the most but the actual surgical sites from the robotics I didn't feel the pain um, The next day, I was surprised that I felt so good. I wanted to get up and move about. Um, I really needed my coffee. I wanted a whole day without coffee. I don't think so. And my water. I've got to have my water. I went in on Monday and came home Friday. That Saturday, we had planned my grandson's second birthday party. I was up doing dishes. I was helping at the birthday party. Mind you, I was fatigued. I did wear down quickly. And we didn't, we had decided not to mention the surgery to family members because the minute they hear cancer, you know, they all freak out, they all worry, they all go to the negative side. We weren't having that. Many of my family members looked at me and they said, no, you did not have surgery. My niece, I had to lift my shirt up and show her the surgical site. That's how well or great I came out of that. I have had major surgeries where I was in bed for two weeks or longer. With this robotics, you're up and about in no time, fending for yourself, which feels really, really good. In the time frame, the year and a half that we went through finding out whether or not I had cancer, I had pretty much decided that I was not going to let it get me down. I was not going to let it be that threatening word. I was going to treat it as just another one of my illnesses. I have arthritis. I have fibromyalgia. Every day I get up and I deal. And that's how 
I had decided to treat this cancer. I didn't know if I was going to have to do chemo or radiation. And I just figured it was going to be another path in my life that I had to take, a bumpy one. I'd come out with a new hairdo, but cancer was not going to get me down, and it was not going to beat me. And I'm here today, and thank you, Dr. Kim, and all of City of Hope and my family. Thank you so much. So thank you again, Angie. Um, you know, it's patients like Angie who really uh, inspire us and um, you know make us uh, love to come to work every day. I always tell patients that you know, I always I feel like um, it's a blessing to be able to help somebody. And when you see uh, uh, someone like Angie share their story, um, it makes it certainly makes me feel blessed. Um, and I think Angie's story will, um, you'll, you'll see how it relates to some of the things that I want to talk about today. But um, just to begin with, I wanted to just um, ask uh, if anybody here knows what is uh, the number one cause of cancer death in the U.S.? Well, what, what, what cancer causes Lung cancer? Prostate, among men, sorry. U.S. men. Prostate cancer? Anything else? Okay, who votes prostate? Okay. Uh, colon, I heard colon. Okay. Um, uh, lung cancer. Anyone say lung cancer? Okay, we got a few lung cancers. So, you know, the, today is the, the topic is lung cancer, so the answer is <laughs> lung cancer. So, um, okay, now this is... Uh, this, this may be a little trickier. What about for U.S. women? Women in the U.S., what cancer causes more deaths than any other Lung. among women? Lung cancer. Okay, a anyone else? Yes. Breast cancer. We have breast cancer. It's a lot of lung cancer. Colon cancer, anyone? Okay, so let's show of hands. Who says breast cancer? Okay, okay we got a couple of breast cancer. Lung cancer. Okay, people are learning from the last one. So it is lung cancer. Okay, so what about worldwide? What cancer causes more deaths than any other? You, this is a smart group, I can tell. So, um, yes. So, again, lung cancer kills more people in the world than any other cancer. In the U.S., it kills more men than any other cancer. In the US, it kills more women than any other cancer. What I'm trying to say is it's a big problem. And if you compare it, it um, with other cancers, it really dwarfs all the other cancers. I mean, um, in 2010, which is the latest year that we have numbers, over 200,000 people uh, were diagnosed with lung cancer. And unfortunately, the vast majority of the people will actually die of their disease. Um, looking at how lung cancer compares with the second biggest cancer killer, or the third, or the fourth, I mean, lung cancer kills more people in the U.S. than, sorry, than the next four cancers combined. Lung cancer kills more Americans than the next four cancers combined. And yet, you know, we don't, we don't really hear about it as much as maybe some of the other cancers. Um, and if you look at the progress that's made, that's been made in cancer treatment over the last 30 years, we see overall, you know, we've made some progress. And we've made a lot of progress in prostate cancer and breast cancer and colon cancer. In lung cancer, there seems to be very little progress. And part of it is that compared to these other cancers, lung cancer gets a lot less funding for research. But another big part of it is that for these other cancers, we have mammogram screening for breast cancer. We have colonoscopy for colon cancer. We have 
PSA for prostate cancer. But what about for lung cancer? You know, we, we find that, like these other cancers, lung cancer, when it's caught early, stage one, we're actually able to cure most of the patients. But unfortunately, most of the patients that we see, in fact, half of them, a little over half, show up with advanced disease, disease that has spread, disease that's gone to the bones or to the brain. And for those patients, it's nearly impossible to achieve a cure. Um, so in terms of screening for lung cancer, there was a big study published a couple years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, which clearly demonstrated that screening for lung cancer with CT scans, with CAT scans, could save lives. Um, so the way the study was uh, organized, um, it divided patients into two groups. One group would just be screened with regular chest x-rays. Another group would be screened with CAT scans. So they get CAT scans every year. And uh, they didn't just take anybody off the street. It, it had to be uh, patients who were 55 to 74 years old. It had to uh, be pretty heavy smokers, people who had smoked uh, what we call 30 pack years, so at least about a pack a day for 30 years. And uh, they either had to be active smokers, people who are still smoking, or people who quit smoking uh, within the last 15 years. And what this study showed was that it, it, compared to people who get lung cancer who aren't screened, where half of the patients have what we call metastatic disease, in this group, more than half the patients were found, when their cancers were detected, they actually had early stage disease disease that we could cure. And it was a minority of patients who developed lung cancer at its most advanced stage. Um, put it another way, if you look at the patients who were, were screened with the CT scan, there was a reduction in, in the number of deaths by 20%. Now, 20% isn't it's not 100%, but this reduction is better than uh, any chemotherapy drug that's ever been approved by the FDA, uh, better than any radiation treatment. It's, um, you know, it's the single most impactful intervention that's been shown for lung cancer or any other cancer. And this, is, this impact is greater than the impact that mammography has been shown to have, colon cancer screening has been shown to have, and that PSA screening has been shown to have. Um, and yet, most insurance companies still do not pay for it. And, um, and we're just, we're waiting. We're waiting for the, the US government, the Preventative Services Task Force, to say it's something that we should do. And then the insurance companies take their cue from this task force to say, OK, we'll pay for it. But right now, we're doing lung cancer screening here at City of Hope. And we've been doing it for years and years. And our program, uh, you can get more information about it at this website. If you're interested in the screening, you can call this number. Um, but uh, this, this program, we have the most experience in Southern California doing lung cancer screening. We've been doing it for a long time. And um, it's something that we, uh, we focus on. Because uh, at City of Hope, you know, we look at screening for cancer as a part of our mission, which is to cure cancer. Um, so we know what we need to do for patients who uh, are at high risk for lung cancer because of their own smoking history. We know that we have this ability to screen them and detect their cancers early. But an emerging problem here in America, and worldwide actually, is uh, the problem of people getting lung cancer who have never smoked, like Angie. And this is a big problem among women, especially. So in the US, 20% of lung cancers that occur in women occur in people who have never smoked. 
And in Asia, it's 60 or 70% of lung cancers in women, never smokers. Um, you know, these are two celebrities who both developed advanced stage, stage four lung cancer, and never smoked. So uh, I think Dr. Recamp is gonna talk about this a little bit later, but it's, a, it's an emerging issue because uh, we don't have a good way of, of systematically catching these cancers early. And the thing about can catching the cancers early is that we're much more likely to be able to do the minimally invasive surgery that Angie had rather than the old-fashioned, big, open operation. And here at City of Hope, we do, for our operations for lung cancer, uh, about 85% of them uh, are done robotically or minimally invasively, compared to across the US, only about 25% are done that way. Um, and there are clear advantages to the minimally invasive or robotic approach. Um, there's less pain, there's better lung function, there's clearly a faster recovery. Um, I think Angie's story is, in, in some ways, um, sounds too good, be too, too good to be true, but it's actually you know, very typical of our patients who have had this type of surgery. And there's, uh, there are definitely fewer complications when we're able to do this operation minimally invasively. And if you look at the survival of the patients, it's no different than the traditional open approach. And um, you know, we have, there are lots of advantages uh, of being able to do things uh, robotically compared to uh, without the robot. And the robot allows us some precision and some, uh, it's a magnified view, so we're looking at everything uh, through the robotic camera and it lets us to see, lets us see things as if uh, we had magnifying glasses on. And the arms of the robot move in such a way that they simulate the same movements of the hands. And it makes the operation certainly easier for me. And this is just an example of um, just one part of a robotic operation. Um, you, here's some structures, here's the pulmonary vein. This is the lung, you're, you're gonna see the heart beating here, you'll see the aorta pulsating back here. And you see, even though you know, the heart's beating here, and it's, um, it's something that we just deal with because the robot allows us the dexterity to you know, get around this blood vessel. We put a little lasso around it, and uh, once that's looped around, we can easily divide it with um, you know, a special device. We can, we can either tie it off or use a stapler. And, um, and the view that you're getting here is much worse than the view that we actually get from the robotic console because uh, the ro robot actually has, it's in high definition and it has uh, three dimensions. So you, you can, it's like wearing 3D glasses. So, um, and if you compare you know, the traditional open approach, which is one large incision uh, where you spread the ribs versus the robotic approach, um, you know, the end result is when we have to spread the ribs apart, it, it, you know, even I think in some ways it's sort of barbaric. You know, you're putting like a big rib spreader between the ribs and you're just, you know, you're stretching them apart. And it's a, it's a fine, it's a fine time-tested way to do the operation. And if there wasn't an alternative, you know, it's what I would recommend to patients still. But, um, but when, when we're able to catch the cancers at an earlier stage, when they're not invading the important major structures, we're able to do the ro operation robotically, and you know, the, these are the types of scars that we leave. Um, and, uh, Dr. Burkamp and I wanted to talk about personalizing the treatment for lung cancer, and, and there's a lot more of that for the advanced stage cancer, because it's driven by molecular tests, but we also personalize the treatment for early stage lung cancer in a lot of different ways. So the standard textbook treatment for early stage lung cancer has been what we call a lobectomy, which is removing uh, a major portion of the lung, which is anywhere between uh, about uh, a quarter to, uh, anywhere between about 10 to 
25% of the entire lung. And that's the, the standard operation. But for patients who are higher risk for whatever reason, or they have really poor lung function, which many of our uh, former smokers have, uh, we have other options where we can take, we can remove less of the lung, which is called a segmentectomy. And the robot allows us to do that much more easily than, uh, than in the past, because in the past, it was difficult to isolate all the blood vessels through a minimally invasive way. And so, you know, we wouldn't do what's called the segmentectomy. We would do kind of what's called a wedge resection, where we just kind of go in there and kick out a little piece of the lung, but not isolate all the uh, small structures. And then there's, we have a uh, really comprehensive pulmonary rehab program, which uh, I like to call it pulmonary prehab because uh, for patients who are high risk, we get them in to see one of our pulmonologists before surgery, and they make sure that they're on all the right medications, and they give them breathing exercises to do, and they actually improve their lung function in anticipation of surgery. And it helps them recover from surgery uh, more easily, and, um, and it helps reduce our uh, complications. And finally, um, we have an excellent program for uh, giving high-dose radiation called stereotactic body radiotherapy uh, for patients who either don't want to have surgery or can't tolerate surgery. And what this is, is it's, it's focused, high-dose, very accurate radiation beams that are um, targeted directly at the tumor. And this can only be done with sort of smaller tumors. But the dosage of the radiation is so high that uh, in this small area that it can actually cure patients. It can kill all the tumors. And um, you know, it's good at sparing the non-cancerous tissue. The treatment takes, each, ta each treatment takes um, less than an hour. The time, of, the time the patient is actually on the radiation table is uh, typically less than half an hour. And the treatments are completed in a week instead of the traditional radiation therapy, which takes a month or a month and a half. And you know, this is the way that we plan the radiation, and the uh, radi radiation therapists actually work with the surgeons to uh, plan the way that we deliver the radiation. So um, in summary, you know, lung cancer is uh, it's a major public health problem in the US and worldwide. It's the major cause of cancer death. Um, but, uh, but we're making progress. And we have lung cancer screening. We have a screening program here at City of Hope. We know that lung cancer screening saves lives. Uh, and we hope that, uh, that uh, with new government recommendations coming down the pipeline that more patients are going to get screened. Um, we also know that you know, most of the time, just like in our experience, uh, when patients do need surgery for lung cancer, most of the time it can be done robotically and minimally invasively. And, um, and finally, for patients who uh, are at high risk or don't want to have surgery or can't have surgery, um, we have other options. Uh, we have surgical and non-surgical options for treating patients with early stage lung cancer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Um, now we're going to move on to lung cancer targeted therapies and personalized medicine options presented by uh, Dr. Karen Reckamp, Associate Professor and Co-Director of the Lung Cancer and Thoracic Oncology Program. She is joined by Lisa Diaz and Vicki Graham. Uh, Vicki will come up first to tell us a little bit about herself and her connection with City of Hope. Good evening. I'm thankful to say I'm a lung cancer survivor. I was 50 years old in October of 2007. I was diagnosed with stage 3B non-small cell adenocarcinoma a few months before my diagnosis, I went to the doctor and I thought I had a lingering swollen gland. I'd recently been sick with a sore throat and I noticed an unusual puffiness at the base of my neck 
in the collarbone area. He said it wasn't a gland and sent me for an MRI. The MRI, MRIs led to a CAT scan, which led to a PET scan. It was those results that led me to Dr. Rec Camp at the City of Hope. When I was referred to the City of Hope is when the possibility of cancer became very real to me. At the time, Dr. Rec Camp felt that it was very unlikely that I had lung cancer. After all, my history of smoking was 30 years prior. My lungs were very healthy and very clear. I had none of the typical signs or symptoms of lung cancer. She told me she wasn't sure what it was I had, but she was gonna stick with me until she found out what I did have. I was immediately at ease and trust with everybody at City of Hope. I had more tests and then the news that it was cancer. You never forget that day. My husband and I were stunned. Everything changes instantly. I met with the surgeon, Dr. Kernstein. Within a few hours, we had me set up for a testing my lymph nodes. If the results were negative, I was a candidate for robotic surgery. If it was positive, it meant chemo and radiation, but no surgery. Two days later, it was confirmed lymph node involvement. Dr. Kernstein then gave me the pep talk of my life. He outlined everything I needed to do to prepare for the battle ahead of me. Most importantly, he told me that my attitude would play a major role in my survival. I was to have at least one key person with me at every doctor appointment, and I needed to take the best possible care of my body by eating healthy and limiting my exposure to illnesses. I felt such a genuine concern for me as a person from Dr. Kernstein, Dr. Redkamp, Dr. Pesner, and nurse practitioner Cindy Kelly, as well as everyone else along the way. There were times I thought, who do they think I am? Do they think I'm somebody important? <laughs> I genuinely felt they were in this with me. Within a week after my diagnosis, I began eight weeks of chemo and radiation concurrently. I was put off work for three months to dedicate all I had for this fight. Daily trips of 65 miles each way, chemo, radiation, and focusing on survival became my life because it had to. It was a whole new world for me. I never got sick from the chemo. I lost my hair, but to my relief, I enjoyed not having to do it every day. I gained weight instead of losing it, like they told me I would, and I stayed healthy. City of Hope provided all the coaching on all aspects on how to take care of myself during those treatments. And we never discussed how long, and I'm so glad that we didn't. From what I Googled myself, I learned that a five-year survival rate was dim. From that, I learned to stop Googling my disease. <laughs> I knew that I had a 30% chance, more or less, to survive beyond the five years. So someone had to be in that 30%, and why couldn't it be me? I recovered and returned to work three months later. I continued for the next four and a half years to have a CT scan every three months, graduated to six months, but at the end of 2011, my CT showed a very slight growth of a spot where my original tumor had been located. I was scheduled for a CT three months later to reevaluate, and by then it had definitely grown. I was referred to Dr. Raz a week later and scheduled for surgery. In the spring of 2012, he removed the lower lobe of my right lung. It was harder for me than chemo and radiation, and at first every breath was very painful. And I have to add in there that I was not a candidate for robotic surgery due to all the scarring I had from radiation. It's what I had to do to live was to go through all that pain. And here I am 19 months later and doing very well. I know everyone's cancer experience is different. For me, the main ingredients are my faith in God, a positive attitude, and being blessed with a wonderful team of doctors. It's hard to express in words how I feel about the City of Hope. Dr. Rakims once said, everyone from the custodians to the scientists here are here because they truly care, and believe me, it shows. It made a world of difference for me to be treated here. Today, I believe wholeheartedly I'm cured and free of cancer thanks to my team of caring, dedicated doctors. I thank Dr. Redkamp, Dr. Raz, Dr. Pesner, and their whole behind-the-scenes team.
Thank you. So I'm inspired. Um, I'll have to echo what Dr. Kim had said that it's really our patients. So Angie, Vicki, Lisa, thank you for coming. Um, you're the reasons why we're here every day. And um, you know, Dr. Kim did a good job at showing us the challenge we're up against. I think um, because everybody in this room is here, um, hopefully we're up to the challenge um, because it's a fight that we're not gonna stop. And this is Lung Cancer Awareness Month. Um, bringing up awareness is part of the key. As Dr. Kim said, the funding for lung cancer is dismally low compared to a lot of other cancers. Yet with that, we move forward. And again, having everybody in this room is the inspiration for taking each step, one day at a time, and uh, making progress for patients with lung cancer. And I think hopefully what we'll show you today um, with the CT screening and with robotic surgery and other options that we have, um, and then talking about uh, treatments for locally advanced and uh, advanced lung cancer, that we are making progress. We are learning more about lung cancer and, um, and we're learning how to treat each patient individually. So, I don't have your, okay. <laughs> So I'm, I'm gonna skip through this because I think, uh, again, Dr. Kim told us about the problem that we have. And I think everybody has seen already tonight, we have three young, beautiful women <laughs> talking about their experience with lung cancer. And if you walked in this room today and said, who has lung cancer? I don't know that you could guess. Um, but the perception is that we have, you know, the Marlboro Man, and you're a heavy smoker, you're older person and you've kind of done this to yourself. And that is not at all what lung cancer is. And it's less and less about smoking. Smoking is still a big problem and if, uh, if smoking is an issue, um, definitely quitting is the best thing to do. But this is not lung cancer. So lung cancer is a combination of genetics, environment, um, happens in smoking and non-smoking. And different genetics um, can differ the level of exposure that is necessary. We know that in women, for the number of cigarettes smoked in a lifetime, they're more likely to get lung cancer than men at the same level. And so there's a lot of components that are involved in determining lung cancer. And so what does lung cancer look like? So these are just images, um, chest x-rays that we look at. And again, as far as screening, they're not good <coughs> screening tools. Um, they generally don't show early stage lung cancers. CT scans um, now more and more are um, being moved forward to, uh, for our screening purposes. Um, and then this is a surgical specimen. And so lung cancer as it's cut out of the body. But then we go further down to look at it under a microscope. And originally, um, when lung cancer was first kind of described, lung cancer was looked at at the type of cells. So we had small cell lung cancer, and under the microscope, they look like small cells. You see the dark circles. And we had non-small cell lung cancer, which had, did not have small cells. <laughs> and that was about as good as we could do pretty much up to about a decade ago. That was about as much as we cared about to determine a person's treatment. But that's not all we can do now. So now we go down to the cellular level and we look at adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, the type of, of, of cancer that um, comes from the lung. And we look at the way the cells are dividing. But we do more than that. We go down to the level of the DNA. And we know that there are genetic changes in lung tumors that can affect how a tumor grows and how we can stop that tumor growth. And we also have effective treatments that can stop this tumor growth. And we're just at the beginning of understanding the genetic implications of lung cancer. So this is kind of an image, and I thought it was, I'm sure most people saw the tree out front 
um, I was, as I was, this is the first time I saw it today, and as I was walking up, I thought, what a nice tree. And then I was walking closer, and I thought, what did they leave there? Who left those carts in front of the tree? <laughs> and then I looked up closer, and I saw the carts lifted, and I saw the, what, the, what it was. So this, is, this reminds me of what we do with lung cancer. Again, several decades ago, we had lung cancer, one disease, treat everybody the same. Then as we get look closer and we start to look at the histology and the different types of cells, we can treat each lung cancer a little differently. And then as we look at the genetics, we see that there are carts there and we can see that there are differences in each one and we can treat each person differently. So I'm gonna speak a little bit about um, locally advanced lung cancer and um, some of the treatments that Vicki had. Um, so locally advanced lung cancer generally means that the lung cancer is within the lung, but even most people, so this is stage one, two, and three, locally advanced is generally in the stage three range, but even that you see in the far column, that most people who have um, that type, any type of lung cancer will develop distant metastases. So lung cancer is a systemic disease in most people from, from the start. And so you need a multidisciplinary team to look at the imaging to determine what the actual staging is. So an important first step, as, as Vicki talked about, is looking at the lymph nodes and the mediastinum um, and working with our surgeons and radiologists to review the images and then do the, the, the biopsies that are necessary. Then once the stage is det determined, deciding whether surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, or what combination is needed. And for most people, it's a combination of those things. And again, um, one of the things that we do well at City of Hope is work as a multidisciplinary team, our surgeons, our, radi our radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, our pulmonologists, our pathologists, our radiologists, working together to come up with a plan that works for each person. And again, in the case of locally advanced disease, it is generally surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, chemotherapy, or a combination of all three. And again, in, in Vicki's case, the surgery came later, which is the rarer kind, um, but, a, uh, but a combination of all three. And again, once a person is cured and gone through multiple treatments for lung cancer, and I think um, both Angie and Vicki can attest to this, that it doesn't kind of end there. There are side effects and there are um, kind of long-term sequelae to deal with. And, um, and we have to continue to have the team involved to help with pain, to help with breathing, pulmonary rehab, um, and then watching the cancer closely because a surgical resection of a cancer or chemotherapy and radiation, the cancer can look as if it's gone, um, and then we need to vigilantly watch because in many people, the cancer does come back. Um, and any patient who has ever had lung cancer, no, many, no matter how many years you're out, are still at risk for other lung cancers. And so things like screening become incredibly important. So I'm gonna move on to talking about advanced disease. So when dis the lung cancer has spread, and again, when Dr. Kim showed this, at least 50% of people will still present with lung cancer that has spread. And it's a big problem. So again, we look to the DNA, and we look to the genetics of the cancer, because that's what gives us our signal. So we've come a long way, and this is looking at people who have stage four lung cancer. And again, Googling these results are not, are not so helpful, and each person has a different story and has a different path, as you hear today. Um, but in general, um, we have seen um, survivals of four to six months, move up to 12 months, and now as we move into genomic and personalized medicine, we're going out years, and that's big progress in a disease that had been pretty devastating. And what we see here is, again, lung cancer, we thought of, uh, especially non-small cell lung cancer, one disease, then subtyping it by adenocarcinoma versus squamous cell carcinoma versus others, and then further subclassifying it, and what you see there on the side are different types of genes that are changed. And this next slide, you'll see the percentages that are here, and the key here is that of, of mutations, so changes in the DNA that we can identify today, 
more than 60% of lung cancers will have some identifiable mutation or genetic change. And when we know about those genetic changes, we can develop treatments that attack signal um, proteins on the tumor cells, within the tumor cells, or within the vasculature. And as we attack those, because uh, then we start to cause tumor regression and blockage of the nutrient system that goes to the tumor to block tumor growth and spread. So I'll just give some examples of targeted therapies that are here today and FDA approved and, and things that we use today. So again, going back to a large group of patients that we used to treat all the same. But we know that not everybody has benefit from specific treatments. So there are going to be some patients who have um, maybe some benefit but way too toxic. And then you have some that there's no toxic effects but there's no benefit from the drug. And then you have those that are toxi have toxicity from the drug and it's not benefiting. In those patients, you don't want to give that drug at all. And then you want to find those patients who have limited toxicity and benefit. And by looking at some of the genetic changes, we're starting to be able to do that, giving the right drug to the right patients at the right time. And so this is, this is an example, and I know it's kind of busy and technical, but I want you to focus on the curve that goes basically straight down. So this is a survival curve, and this is a study where we looked at chemotherapy versus a targeted therapy to something called the epidermal growth factor receptor. And early on, um, as we studied these epidermal growth factor receptors inhibitors, we found that many women, many non-smokers, and many people who had Asian ethnicities responded well to these treatments. And we thought we could treat these people by looking at them to decide what kind of treatment we needed. In this study, they took these same, all, all these people who were Asian, non-smoking, um, people, and they, they, they gave them one drug or another, and they found that they harmed one group of patients. The group of patients that they harmed were the patients who did not have the genetic change for the EGFR, for the EGFR mutation. So this told us that you can't look at a person and know what treatment's going to be beneficial. You need to know what the tumor genetics shows, and that's important for lung cancer. For breast cancer, we've been testing um, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, HER2 for a long, long time. But for lung cancer, again, we just looked under a microscope. So to decide that you need to have a genetic change to understand which patients would benefit from a treatment was important. And to know that you could harm people by not knowing. So knowing the genetic makeup of the tumor is incredibly important. Then moving on to another story, something called ALK. So ALK has been um, important in lymphomas in the past and um, was not really understood in lung cancers. But there was an ALK inhibitor that was, in, um, that was being studied in 2006. And there were a group of people with lung cancer who were responding very well, but nobody really understood why. In 2007, some very smart researchers in Japan discovered the ALK gene had a, had a change in it in lung cancer. They then went back and looked at these patients who responded and looked at the tumor and found the same genetic change. So again, a specific change in a tumor causing very good responses for lung cancer. And again, this drug was being tested before we even knew that this change existed. So we are moving forward at a fast pace. This drug, crizotinib, took about two and a half years to get approved and actually just today got full official approval from the FDA, um, so pretty exciting. And again, in, 2000 and in 2006, we didn't even know this gene existed for lung cancer. And again, this is just showing um, on the top slide is um, improved um, survival for people who get this, um, this new targeted drug versus chemotherapy. And this is another, um, something called ROS1, R-O-S-1, which is another um, genetic change in lung cancer and also responds to this crizotinib, this drug um, that is important for ALK. And what you're looking at here on the bottom, so usually these, for most chemotherapies, tumor shrinks in about 25% of people with lung cancer. 
other people will have benefit in other ways, but the actual tumor shrinkage happens in a small percentage. What you're seeing here um, between basically the green and yellow lines are the number of people who have had tumor shrinkage, which is the majority of people treated with this drug. So the genetic change and the given the right drug, we see much more benefit than just giving a bunch of, of people with lung cancer some chemotherapy to attack everything. And this is specific. So today, we have a number of inhibitors that block specific genes, and um, some of them are more in, uh, in investigation right now, and some of them are FDA approved. So the ones that have FDA approved um, indications are on the far left. Um, but we have many that are, in, um, that are under investigation and have potential approved drugs in other diseases. And, um, and I, Lisa will talk about some of that too because we have her, you know, HER2, which happens in breast cancer, can also happen in lung cancer. And some of the drugs we use for breast cancer can be very helpful for these people. And um, BRAF, which is important for melanoma, can be important for lung cancer patients. Once, um, once cancer cells are exposed to certain drugs, they tend to get smart and learn how to grow despite these drugs. And so we're also working on just trying to find uh, mechanisms of resistance. And we also have um, new inhibitors that more potently bind to these areas on the DNA um, and we, that can overcome potential resistance and also that may block other areas that cause signals to the DNA to block resistance. Um, and so these are some of the drugs that we're looking at. One um, important drug is something called an HSP90 inhibitor. And what it actually does is binds to client proteins like the ALK and the EGFR to stabilize them. So by blocking this, um, we can more actively inhibit um, the EGFR and the ALK, and especially when they become um, resistant to other drugs. So these, this is a, an important drug that may be important in lots of diseases. Another area that we're looking at beyond targeting specific genes is looking at activating our own immune systems to attack lung cancer. And again, that has a little broader implication um, because when you're talking about these specific genes, you see some of the percentages are 1% and 2%, which are very small numbers um, and important when you have 200,000 people diagnosed each year, but, um, but still harder to get at. Everybody's got an immune system. And in lung cancer, almost everybody's immune system is decreased. And so activating that immune system and reactivating that immune system to attack the cancer can be an important part of, uh, of lung cancer therapy. So very recently, there are some new drugs called PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors, and they're called immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, and they are, they are drugs that, that bind in this area here where so we have, a, we have uh, T cells and um, what we call antigen presenting cells, which kind of take pieces of the tumor and present them to, to our immune system so that our immune system can attack the cancer cells or the foreign cells. Um, and it's similar to what happens when you get your flu vaccine. You, you, you get that attack and then you get other signaling to develop other immune cells that will remember and potentially attack those cells in the future. And so it's, it's, it's activating your immune system. So what these, what these drugs can do is they block these, these, these signals that are normally there, they actually are blocked so that you're not attacking your own body like autoimmune diseases can do. But they're overactivated in lung cancer patients. So by blocking these inhibitory signals, we can reactivate the immune system. And the important thing of that, and this is again another technical slide, but you see um, kind of down the middle, you see response rates of 17, 45%, 10%, 20%. Um, and again, we talked about with chemotherapy, usually about 25% will have shrinkage of their tumor. This is with the immune therapy alone, no chemotherapy, just a drug that activates the immune system. And with our own activation of immune system, can attack the cancer and cause tumor shrinkage. And these are in early studies right now, and we're testing them against chemotherapy, but it really is um, pretty profound to be able to attack, use your own immune system to attack the cancer. And so, again, where we're going in early diagnosis, 
when we're looking at assessment of uh, treatment and toxicity and looking at, um, at evaluating the, the responses to treatment, it's about understanding the biology of the tumor. Often multiple uh, biopsies are needed to understand the course of the tumor because over time the tumor can change in its nature, the mutations and things. And, and again, you wouldn't treat a breast cancer patient without having enough tumor to understand ER and PR status and HER2 status. You shouldn't be treating a lung cancer patient without enough tissue to understand the molecular biology of the lung cancer. And again, in 2013, we're just at the start of understanding this biology, but we are providing benefit to people. And I think um, Lisa is going to tell us our, her story. And I think what, what's so remarkable to me is that at the time of the diagnosis, um, the treatment that we have for her cancer right now, we would have never guessed. And it's only available to her now because we keep opening our minds and thinking, what can we do next? How can we meet this challenge? And I think as you leave this room and think about it tonight, how can we meet this challenge, this difficult challenge of lung cancer? Because we're in this together. Thank you. Good evening. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Repcamp for inviting me to speak tonight about my journey and um, targeted chemotherapy from a patient's perspective. I was diagnosed with stage four non-small cell lung cancer in um, July of 2009. Some of you may wonder, most of you may wonder if I smoked, and I did. I started smoking on average a half pack a day when I was in my late teens and I quit when I was 40. I quit because I wanted to live a long life. And so, I mean, when I was diagnosed, I felt how ironic, um, you know, I was diagnosed with lung cancer only seven years after I quit smoking at the age of 47. I started chemotherapy treatments uh, much like everyone else does. I was frightened, I was stunned, and I was in disbelief. Dr. Retkamp chose a strong combination of chemotherapies for me to begin with, and we just kind of hoped for the best, and the results were pretty good. So I would spend the next four years on generalized chemotherapies. The side effects were numerous for me. Um, Least of all, I lost my hair twice, but um, I had to deal with neuropathy in my feet, um, muscle and joint pain, overall fatigue. That seemed to be my nemesis. I was fatigued all the time. My eyes on one chemotherapy just wouldn't stop watering. Um, I had sensitivities in my mouth. And I just felt tired all the time. I worked for the first year and a half um, full-time from home and then I just I couldn't do it anymore and I I went on medical leave um, I wasn't during this time well for the last four and a half years until about four months ago I wasn't able to really plan um, occasions with family and friends with any certainty I just um, never knew when I was going to feel good the times when I did feel good was uh, seemed to be limited to the week before my next treatment and I was on a a three to four week treatment schedule. I spent a lot of days meeting with doctors, um, feeling weak and just lying in bed trying to process the gravity of the situation that I found myself in. I'm finding it a little bit more difficult to speak about my last four and a half years than I thought I would. Um, in addition to the side effects, uh, generalized chemotherapy made me very ill on two separate occasions. 
10 months into treatment, I found myself in a hospital. The treatment I was on wasn't working and I was finding it difficult to breathe. After one week of special care, I came home on oxygen. It would be two long months before I could find the strength to get up and move again. I actually visited Dr. Redcap in a wheelchair a couple times and I could just barely hold my head up to talk with her. Not until after I was better did Dr. Rutkamp tell me how worried she was about me. And she told me that she looked back and thought that at that time the time had come to talk to me about hospice and end of life. And I'm so thankful that it wasn't my time. The second time I found my myself in the hospital was one year ago. I started on a new generalized chemotherapy and it was too strong for me. Eight days into the treatment, I spiked a fever and my husband brought me to City of Hope's emergency room. Many of my vitals were unstable, so they moved me to the ICU and I spent four nights there and one additional night in the hospital wing. Dr. Redcap, I've always kind of wondered, and I've never asked you this before, but when I was hospitalized in the ICU the second time, I often wonder if you thought maybe it would be time again to talk about end of life. Not that time. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> life on generalized chemotherapy wasn't all bad. Um, I did have some fun. On occasion, I was able to golf with my husband, Tony, and I made a bucket list and I, two of the things on my bucket list was to parasail for the first time. So Tony and my friend Connie here, we all three went pa parasailing together and then the next event was skydiving. So the three of us went skydiving together and that was such a rush and I would do it again in a heartbeat, in a heartbeat. Early this year, Dr. Camp told me that chemotherapy options were running out for me. But she told me that the medical community was learning more and more about cancer cells. And she told me that something would come up for me. And I believed her. I'll never forget the day that I received the news from Carrie Christensen, my nurse. She told me that they had learned something new about my cancer cells. They had run some tests, some genetic tests, and I was going to start on a new targeted therapy. It wasn't a therapy for lung cancer, but it was a melanoma drug. I remember my husband and I and a friend, again, Connie, <laughs> were ecstatic when we received the news and we were in our kitchen just like high-fiving high each other <laughs> because we were so happy. It's been four months since I've been on melanoma drugs. I've been on two. Um, this, there are side effects with all of this stuff, but the upside was a miraculous reduction in my cancer. I'm full of energy now, and I'm using the energy to become physically stronger, and I'm helping my husband out more around the house. I smile more and I laugh more. And most important, I have ever increasing hope for the future. I'm very lucky to be standing in front of you tonight. I owe a big thank you to Dr. Retkamp. She is super smart. She thinks outside the box. And she remained diligent in her search to find a better treatment for me. I'm not sure what kind of life I would be living right now if she hadn't done her research. I'm honored to be her patient, and I feel privileged to have the City of Hope behind me. In conclusion, if you are a doctor here tonight, please keep looking for better ways to treat your patient. And if you're a patient, tell your doctor my story. Maybe there is a targeted therapy for you. Thank you.
thank you lisa and thank you everyone for your stories and your presentations so now we're going to move on to the question and answer session of the program and again um, our doctors can't answer any second opinion type questions um, and if you have any questions for our guest speakers too about their experience uh, feel free to ask them So, it's working. Yeah, I have a question for Dr. Camp about that chart with the mutations on it, where you had the EGFR and the ALK listed. You also had something um, KRAS mutation that that it said there's a 30 percent prevalence. So, are there any therapies developed yet or in in clinical trial for that particular mutation? Because it didn't list anything. So, so the the KRAS mutation. The KRAS mutation is um, more, the most common mutation that we find in non-small cell lung cancer, um, but is a little more challenging in um, finding a directed therapy. We do have some that are in development, but we don't have specific therapies that are available today. But it is, it is a high area of interest and research right now, and um, some very good improvements over the past few years. Hi, I have a question for Dr. Kim. Can you elaborate a little bit more about the outcomes for patients with the surgery versus the SBRT? Uh, <clears throat> well, the surgery is still the standard of care for early stage lung cancer. And the reason is because um, in terms of long-term survival, we know we have a proven track record with surgery. SBRT is a newer therapy and uh, there are some drawbacks of SBRT. One is that it causes a, a scar in the lung such that um, we never really know whether or not all the cancer is gone. For the, we'll always see, whenever we do a follow-up scan, we'll always see something there, and patients have some anxiety because they see something on the scan, and we don't know if there's some cancer left over or not. Um, what we know from long-term, the best long-term data is that uh, the recurrence rates for SBRT are a little bit higher than they are for surgery. But uh, the advantages of the SBRT is that there's no pain with the treatment. Uh, the recovery time is uh, almost zero. And patients are generally able to uh, go about their normal routines and normal lives without a significant interruption. But uh, the trade-off is um, probably a little bit higher risk of the cancer coming back. Good evening. Um, three and a half years ago, I had a lobectomy. Six weeks prior to that, my sister had a lobectomy. Seven years prior to that, our mother died. Ten years prior to our lobectomies, my brother died. And 40 years before that, my father died, all of lung cancer. Um, we have one sister who has been untouched by lung cancer, and she just had her first CAT scan, which she had to pay for out of pocket because the insurance company refused to, <laughs> to cover it. Uh, and thank goodness she um, is clear of any lung cancer. My question is, um, I have two daughters that I worry about, and I wonder at what point do we start scanning them, or is there any other way of preventing or checking for lung cancer in them? And also, um, my other question is, <laughs> I'm scanned um, initially every six months, now uh, once a year. My sister's cancer has uh, returned. It's pretty aggressive and pretty advanced. And of course, I worry every day that the same thing will happen to me. Um, other than scans, is there any other way of checking for recurrence? So I, I not today. Um, as far as screening, 
um, with low-dose CT screening, it's still really reserved for people who have smoking history because although we can reduce um, deaths from lung cancer with CT screening, there are also benign things that are found that can lead to procedures and can lead to other issues. So if you don't have a high smoking history, there's no, still not a recommendation for screening for people who haven't smoked, even if there's a strong family history. There are some genetic tests that can be done that have, that when there are clusters in families and we have a um, genetic program here, um, so it might be worth um, meeting with the genetic counselors here. Um, but outside of that, as far as screening, there's not something today. Five years, 10 years, you know, as your daughters grow, there may be something. So keeping it in, in touch with the, the advances is one thing, and, but potentially going with, through with the genetic screening. Um, as far as follow-up with your cancer, I'll let Dr. Kim. You, um, I agree with uh, Dr. Kemp. Right now, the way we follow patients with lung cancer is we get CAT scans, and um, but right, but we are working on ways to detect lung cancer in the blood, and those same tests that will help uh, figure out you know, which patients need to be screened for lung cancer or may substitute for CT scans in the future may also be the answer to how should we follow the patients who are done with their treatment. But um, the issue of, you know, as we get better at treating lung cancer, what we are encountering is um, a whole group of patients who are survivors. And that's great, um, but that poses new challenges. And we're trying to develop uh, programs now, and we're, we're actually studying ways to um, ways that we can help patients uh, through what we call survivorship. Once their treatment is done, um, helping them anticipate what will lie in the future, and uh, figuring out ways we can help to improve their overall health. Hi, two, two parts all related. Um, comparing smokers and non-smokers, uh, uh, how do the cancer rates uh, compare with them? And then does among smokers, what are the uh, statistics, the odds, chances of developing cancer? So how does smoker, non-smokers compare in, in cancer and then amongst just smokers, what are the chances of getting lung cancer? So um, I'll, I'll answer that. Um, a lot of it, as Dr. Burkamp was saying, a lot of it depends on your own genetic background, other risk factors. So uh, in the U.S., the vast majority of lung cancers, 85%, are somehow related to smoking. Uh, of the 15% that are not related to smoking, um, some of these are related to other risk factors, so a uh, family history or um, other ex expo exposures to other things that are related to lung cancer like asbestos exposure or um, exposure to radon, which is um, a, f uh, a substance that's found in some uh, minerals and, and, and rocks. Um, and so uh, any of those factors increases the risk um, and and all those factors actually combined with smoking increases the risk. Um, among non-smokers, uh, the risk of lung cancer is actually very low. And the, um, and to get it, what is the <coughs> risk for a smoker, um, it depends on those other factors that I mentioned. It also depends on things like uh, how much you smoke. So uh, we know that people who smoke more heavily have a higher risk of lung cancer. Uh, but as like Dr. Recamp was mentioning, we know that uh, for whatever reason, women tend to be more sensitive to the effects of cigarette smoke. So they, uh, even women who, a lot of women who didn't smoke heavily are at higher risk than, uh, than men who smoked an equivalent amount for whatever reason. And uh, lastly, uh, non-smoking women are at higher risk than 
focused on tilting that. Um, we don't know the reasons why, but um, and and there's I said that was last, but there are you know ethnic differences too. So as a in Asia, uh, if you look at uh, and and lung cancer is the bit you know for most of, for many countries in Asia, lung cancer is the biggest cause of cancer death. And if you look at uh, East Asian countries, the majority of women who get lung cancer in those countries are never smokers. And still a minority of people who smoke will get lung cancer. It's not the majority. 10, 20 percent. So. I have a question, I think, for Dr. Kim. Um, what are the characteristics of the lesions that are, um, that have the best prognosis for the SBRT therapy? Yeah, um, the main thing is the size of the lesion. So the smaller the lesion, the more likelihood, the, the, the more likely that it will be effective. Um, so uh, tumors that are smaller than a couple inches, like let's say like three centimeters, the uh, chance of cure for, um, for that tumor can be 90% or greater. Um, but once you get beyond five centimeters, then uh, the chances are much less likely. So that's one thing. The other thing is that the location of the tumor. So there are uh, areas, um, for instance, you know, right near the major airways uh, or right near some of the major blood vessels where um, we can't deliver as high a dose of radiation. And then uh, those patients may not be even candidates for SBRT. Or if they are, sometimes we need to sort of um, design the radiation in such a way to minimize the effect of those areas. But, um, but once you get to be closer to the vital structures, uh, it's, it's much harder to deliver the full dose of radiation. So what we're looking for is uh, small tumors that are far away from the major structures. And the uh, other important thing is, and we talked about, is that the SBRT is only for early stage tumors that haven't spread anywhere. That includes lymph nodes, uh, which are re removed routinely as part of surgery. Those don't get treated with the SBRT. Um, uh, we, our radiation department does do that. Um, it, there is less experience with it worldwide uh, than with treating primary lung cancers, lung can cancers that start in the lung. But uh, we do have experience of treating cancers that have spread to the lung um, from other, from, you know, colon cancer that started in the colon and spread to the lung. And um, it is an effective treatment uh, and it is a treatment option for certain patients. Yeah, could you comment on the difference between the smoker and the non-smoker and secondhand smoke and also about smog in the Southern California basin over the last 30 years? So, so again, as we talked about, smoking is still the biggest cause of for developing lung cancer. Secondhand smoke has been more difficult to tease out. There definitely is a component of secondhand smoke, um, but it, it hasn't been studied as well because um, it's, it's kind of difficult to quantify. Um, so people are working on that, and especially um, we're actually working on uh, opening a study to look at screening in people exposed to secondhand smoke. Um, so those things are being studied, but not well defined right now. Um, but definitely there's a component. And the smog <coughs> is definitely an issue. And again, as, as Dr. Kim was saying, all the, the, the proportion of women that are non-smoking in Asia where there is high air, air pollution, um, there, that may be a cause. But again, it's still um, something we're starting to tease out. For a very long time, we believe that most lung cancers were caused by smoking. We didn't spend a lot of time looking into the non-smoking component. That's probably 
15 years that we've been looking at the non-smoking component. So we're behind the eight ball a little bit in understanding non-smoking lung cancer, which we're understanding is a bigger proportion of lung cancers than we ever knew. I'm curious, I'm sure you didn't just walk into the operating room and they had you put your hands into a robot and say, here you go. I mean, <laughs> with all the robotic surgery, what was involved for you personally to go from conventional surgery to robotic? So I was lucky in the sense that um, in my training, so I, d I did uh, a special thoracic surgery fellowship at the um, at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. And, and there, as part of my training, I learned to do robotic surgery. Um, and so it's an environment where, you know, there's a senior surgeon who's watching you, making sure that you, you're safe. But even prior to that, prior to ever operating on a patient robotically, um, the thing about the robot is that you know, because uh, there's an interface with technology. I spent hours, just like a pilot does in a flight simulator, I spent hours um, on a simulator so I could just learn the system. And then after that, I, uh, I practiced on uh, a model, an animal model. So we took out lung uh, in a pig. And then, um, and then after that, you know, operated on a patient, but uh, under supervision. And then, you know, once I was comfortable, then did it on my own. Okay, uh, this is this question is for Dr. Ray Kam. Uh, well I want to know what are the symptoms of lung cancer because um, I have family members and I have uh, co-workers that have been dying and no diagnosis until no diagnosis until the three or four stage only has six months of life or a year. So unfortunately that's one of the difficulties with lung cancer is that when lung cancer is early there are usually no symptoms and again so for people who are high risk who have had 30 pack years more 30 uh, pack per day or more for 30 years or more um, should undergo screening because that's the best way to find it early. As far as um, symptoms of lung cancer, they're usually due to the symptoms in the lungs, coughing, shortness of breath, um, coughing up blood sometimes, pain in the chest, but can also be associated with symptoms that have shown that the, the cancer has spread, pain in the bones, headache, um, things like that. Um, but again, usually when there are symptoms, it is because it has spread or grown to a, s a size that makes it difficult to do surgery and localized treatment. <laughs> How soon after surgery? would you recommend having, if you needed chemotherapy, is there a time frame that you have to have it? So generally we would recommend, you would want somebody to be recovered from the surgery, so usually beyond one month and usually prior to three months. Somewhere in that two to three month range is the optimal time. And that's optimal. And what if it's done after that? It's just not as effective? Well, so generally the reasons we do, sur we do chemotherapy after surgery, so, um, a centimeter tumor is about a billion cancer cells, right? So the surgeon goes in and takes out the cancer and it's gone, nobody can see it. But as you saw, one of the tables I put up shows that distant cancer cells can be found in most people even with early stage lung cancers. So the reason that we're doing the chemotherapy is to get rid of cancer cells we cannot see, okay? And we wanna do it early on. And so the more months you get out, the more chances those those cancer cells that we can't see can establish themselves. So we wanna do it early. So beyond three months, there's not a lot of good information to say that you're benefiting anything. So you may move it out to four months if it takes a little longer to recover, but um, 
two to three months is really um, the optimal time. possibility in the future of lung transplants versus uh, treatment? Well, um, lung transplants have been used to treat a very specific type of lung cancer that's very unusual and um, the outcomes weren't great. Uh, the problem with transplant of any type uh, is a lack of organs. So uh, it's for kidney transplant, lung transplant, heart transplant, liver transplant. There are more people waiting for organs than there are donors. And, um, and the, the, the problem with lung cancer is that, um, as Dr. Verkamp has pointed out, most of the time when the cancer comes back, if the cancer comes back, it comes back not in the lung, not in the chest, but elsewhere, in the brain or the bone. Um, and so, you know, it's, it, it's hard to argue for um, using this precious resource, a lung, uh, to implant it into a person who, uh, you know, if, you, if, you're, if, you're, if the person's lung cancer is so advanced that they're requiring transplant to, to treat, then the chances are the, chance, the cancer is going to come back, and it's going to come back elsewhere. It's not going to come back where we've done the transplant. And then, you know, that person is not going to maybe get the full benefit of this lung, which could have gone to someone else who didn't have cancer um, and could have lived a very long time. And the level of immunosuppression that is required post-transplant probably makes a person more susceptible to recurring because you're dampening the immune system even more. We have time for one more question. Um, is there anything that you can do to prepare for a person before they go into the radiation uh, chemotherapy? As far as the diet, daily diet? <laughs> so a diet is a favorite question, and I'm not a nutritionist or dietitian, um, but for the most part, you want to stay healthy. Eating a balanced diet and um, trying to maintain a person's weight is important. So cutting out full food groups is usually not a good idea right before chemotherapy, surgery, or radiation, but eating a well-balanced diet being healthy um, is really the best way to get through it. Hi, increasing protein intake, um, especially when with radiation and chemotherapy. Um, so when you're, if your calories are reduced, making, making sure those calories are high protein calories can be helpful for maintaining <coughs> weight and um, energy. Actually, red meat can help increase uh, blood counts some, in some people. So everything, everything in moderation. Okay, so this concludes our program. <laughs> really, really great questions. I hope you all can walk away feeling more informed about lung cancer, um, the lung cancer care and treatments that we provide here at City of Hope. Um, I want to thank our physicians for presenting tonight and, of course, uh, our special guests for being here, um, Lisa, Vicki, and Angie. Thank you so much for sharing your stories with us. And um, on your way out, don't forget to drop off your evaluations. And um, I hope to see you all again soon. Our next Ask the Experts will be in January. Thank you. Thank you.